Don't forget, you can reach the latest episode of Potomac Watch anytime. Just ask your smart speaker, play the Opinion Potomac Watch podcast. From the Opinion pages of the Wall Street Journal, this is Potomac Watch. Welcome back. Kim, the other point on the NDAA bill is it is often one of those pieces of legislation that they call a Christmas tree in Washington because everybody comes up and hangs some sort of hobby horse on it. Can you talk a little bit about where that stands? I know there's some things floating around in the Senate about marijuana banking and antitrust in the media. Do you think we're still in a place where the Senate is going to try to get that stuff added to the bill? Or given what the House has passed, could we end up with a relatively clean NDAA piece of legislation in the end. Well, well done to the House, by the way. I don't always say this, but I was pleased to see that they passed a pretty clean bill and sent it along, did not go down the road of hanging all this extraneous legislation on it. Now, that being said, it's been delivered into the hot little hands of Senator Chuck Schumer. The marijuana bill that you mentioned is a priority of his. This is something that would make it easier for banks to work with marijuana shops. And this is at the top of Chuck Schumer's agenda. There are people like Amy Klobuchar who are pushing for this antitrust bill. It would basically allow certain exemptions and publishers in terms of how they negotiate with social media companies. That's another one. Uh, Joe Manchin is pushing for his permitting bill, which got left by the wayside. This was something that Schumer had promised him after that climate and healthcare spending bill that passed this summer. He's never got it. And this is all happening because Congress is such a mess that it's highly possible that the NDAA will be the only bill that gets passed this year. And so everyone is looking at that vehicle to attach their special projects. So we even have a couple of senators, Kirsten Sinema and Tom Tillis, thinking about trying to hang an immigration reform on it. Mitch McConnell, in the last few days, the minority leader has become much more critical of this and started calling out largely the Democrats who are trying to hang things onto this and saying that they risk fouling up the bill and making it impossible to get it passed by the end of the year, which would be a first, by the way. Congress, as bad as it is at everything else, almost always gets, well, always does get the NDAA passed. So we'll see if they battle that reality. They may have to in the end because if anything got stuck on this now, it would have to go back to the House again and have another fight over that. And they are simply running out of time. Speaking of Kirsten Sinema, she has been under pressure from her Democratic colleagues in the past two years to vote to break the filibuster, to vote on the Inflation Reduction Act, so-called. It has been clear all along that she hasn't enjoyed that pressure. And now she announces that she's leaving the Democratic Party and re-registering in Arizona as an independent. When she was asked on CNN yesterday about whether this would change anything about the organization of the coming Senate these next two years, here's what she said. That's kind of a D.C. thing to worry about. What I'm really focused on is just making sure that I'm doing what I think comports with my values and the values of Arizonans. So when I come to work each day, it'll be the same. I'm going to still come to work and hopefully serve on uh, the same committees I've been serving on and continue to work well with my colleagues of both political parties. And I'm not really spending much time worrying about what the mechanics look like for Washington, D.C. And to be honest, Jake, I don't think anyone in Arizona is caring about that either. Um, So I don't think things will change much for me. And I don't think things will change much for Arizonans. Kate, what do you make of this? I mean, it seems to me that Senator Raphael Warnock's victory in the Senate runoff in Georgia changes the dynamic a little bit because then we would have a 51-49 Senate in Democratic control with Kirsten Sinema as part of the party. And without, we have 50-49-1. and And so I don't see how this changes much about how the Senate is going to run in the next two years. But fascinating that she waited until Warnock's victory (laughs) <laughs> to come out and make this decision. Right. And you had Chuck Schumer saying, uh, you know, Cinema has always been an independent, which is an interesting spin on it and is going to leave her on her committee assignments on the banking committee, for instance. So clearly she had received at least some implicit blessing to do this now that Warnock had run his seat. Uh, there are a number of ways to view it. I think, you know, 
everyone is watching to see what Joe Manchin does now. Both Manchin and Cinema have to defend their seats in a couple of years. I am watching this closely because I'm interested to see what she's got up her sleeve here and what she is angling to do. Is she angling to prevent a primary challenge? It's an interesting question. So I think Cinema is shown to be somewhat an interesting and shrewd politician. And I'm curious to see what exactly she's trying to get out of this move. To my eye, Kim, that's exactly what this is about, is she knows she's worried about a primary challenge in the Democratic primary in 2024. And as an independent, she doesn't have to run in that primary. And she has a couple of years now where she can make the case to Arizonans that she's working on behalf of them as an independent voice. And it gives Democrats a difficulty, I think, because cinema is still effectively on many policies. She's on the Democratic side. And so do they want to run a, a strong candidate against her as a Democrat and risk splitting the vote that agrees with them on the issues, which could potentially pave the way for a Republican to take back that seat, Kim? Or, or am I wrong about that calculation? No. And in fact, you know, the more you look at this decision that Kirsten Sinema made, the more you have to admire her because it is clever in so many ways. As she was saying there, she expects to continue running her subcommittees. That was a little message to Chuck Sumer saying, you better not try to discipline me over this because I still retain the ability to go caucus with whomever I want. And so she's made managing to kind of keep her seniority and her position, even as she has left the party. She sent them a message, the leadership saying, don't count on me. Don't take my vote for granted. Don't pressure me. Don't treat Joe Manchin like mud. Don't start pressuring us again to get rid of the filibuster because we have some real muscle here still, even if you've added to your seat count by one. And then, yeah, the home state primary thing, which is, first of all, in doing this, she asked allies herself with the many Arizonans who register as independent. It is a unique state in that way. There is an extremely high number of independents. And so that gets her more in line with a lot of folks in the state. And Democrats, yes, they can go ahead and run a candidate from the progressive left against her. But she narrowly won that election last time around. And as you say, it's highly likely that she would split a vote with a Democrat and pave the way for a Republican senator. So there's going to be a lot of pressure, at least the behind the scenes circles, for everybody to keep out and let her go her way. In the meantime, she's put some insulation around her, both in terms of the pressure she's going to face and in terms of it getting in the same place as a lot of Arizona voters. Kim, you mentioned Joe Manchin, and I think that's also a, an interesting point of comparison, because I think on many of the issues, Kirsten Cinema is probably more of a Democrat, more of a progressive, more of a liberal than Joe Manchin is. And if you want some data to back that up, 538 has a site, does your member of Congress vote with or against Biden? And they rank percentages. And so Kirsten Cinema votes with Biden's position at 93% of the time. Joe Manchin, only 88% of the time. And remember, you got to grade those kinds of numbers on a curve because a lot of these are non-controversial votes. So the highest Republican is Susan Collins with 68 percent. And so that's the gap between the two parties, 92 to 68. Kate, I think that that the pressure on cinema is really what made her make this decision. Again, I think she's very much on the Democratic side in terms of policy, but she didn't like being strong armed. She didn't like being attacked by members of her own party because she didn't think that destroying the filibuster was in the best interests of the country. And so I, I think it's some of those tactics that they've used on Kirsten Cinema that they also, by the way, have been using on Joe Manchin that caused her to make this move. And I'm skeptical that Joe Manchin would ever follow suit simply because he has been such a Democrat for decades sort of socially and culturally, but maybe it's not a foregone conclusion. And Kate, we'll give you the last word. Yeah, well, I think the percentage of times they vote for the reasons you described is one illustration, but not the most helpful of how allied they are with Biden or not. I mean, Joe Manchin pretty much single-handedly torpedoed the extension of the larger child tax credit by basically making the case that it discouraged people to work. And even though that's only one element, it was an enormous priority of the Biden administration. But yes, I think we'll all eyes on him and we'll see if he is tired of the same tactics that may have contributed to cinema's departure. Thank you, Kate and Kim. Thank you all for listening. You can email us at pwpodcast at wsj.com. If you like the show, please hit that subscribe button. And we will be back next week with another edition of Potomac Watch.